Hi and welcome to Mrs Long's video lesson on the poem An African Thunderstorm by David Rubadiri. So David Rubadiri is a Malawian poet. Uh, he studied overseas and spent some time as the ambassador to the USA. And um, the fact that he's an African poet writing from an African perspective will come into, um, into play later on when we look at um, perhaps a little bit more of a in figurative interpretation of the poem. Let's have a look at the poem first. An African thunderstorm. From the west, clouds come hurrying with the wind, turning sharply here and there, like a plague of locusts, whirling, tossing up things on its tail, like a madman chasing nothing. Pregnant clouds ride stately on its back, gathering to perch on hills like sinister dark wings. The wind whistles by and trees bend to let it pass. In the village, screams of delighted children toss and turn in the din of the whirling wind. Women, babies clinging on their backs, dart about in and out, madly. The wind whistles by whilst trees bend to let it pass. Clothes wave like tattered flags flying off to expose dangling breasts as jagged blinding flashes rumble, tremble and crack amidst the smell of fired smoke and the pelting march of the storm. Probably one of the first things you notice when you have a look at this poem is that it's very seems to have a very random structure. In fact, the most notable thing about the structure is that there isn't much. The stanzas are different lengths, the lines are all different lengths, and it seems to be quite unpredictable. It's quite a nice way to mirror the nature of a storm, though. If you think about um, the natural world and the unpredictability of weather, particularly of extreme weather, um, and the movement that's created in the poem by this chosen structure or lack thereof, it fits quite well. So basically the structure of the stanzas, the way the stanzas are laid out, follows the phases of the storm as it um, is developing and then as it hits. So the first two stanzas, um, there's the sense of um, increasing tension as the storm is building it's gathering momentum and it focuses on the impact that the storm has on nature. We almost zoom in a little bit in the third stanza where we get um, this vision of a village as the storm is about to break and then with the people's reaction in the village. And then the fourth stanza is the storm breaking. <coughs> Excuse me. As I mentioned, this poem is quite interesting in the, the movement, the sense of movement that is created by the different imagery and use of literary devices. And the wind is quite important. It's almost as if the wind itself is like a character in the poem. Um, and it's specifically alluded to, but also the movement of things. We experience the wind through how we see things being moved around. So if you think about how you've experienced storms before, um, think about that the growing sense of almost electricity that grow, develops in the air before you even know there's going to be a storm, and then how the weather changes, the sky darkens, the wind picks up, perhaps there's a light rain, the clouds start looming dark over the horizon, and then as the storm gets closer, you start experiencing the more extreme forms of these weather changes that happen, which makes this poem really um, effective in its use of sensory imagery to help us experience the storm as if we were in the middle of it. Now, on the surface, this is a poem about a storm hitting an, an African, a rural African village. But there is another more figurative interpretation which could be alluding to a storm of a different sort. And um, when you look at particular wording, like this, the African storm is coming in from the west um, and causing havoc and destruction on an African setting, perhaps you can see how 
many people choose to interpret this poem also perhaps as a description of the ravaging effects of colonization on Africa. We'll have a look at that more towards the end of the video. Okay, so in the first stanza, we get this image of the storm rolling in, as we said, from the west. There's quite dark imagery in terms of the clouds being described as a plague of locusts as they darken the sky. Um, if you look at the, the image here on the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see, the, if you've never experienced a plague of locusts, this idea of just like this cloud of locusts literally coming in, taking over. The wind is whirling and tossing things about, and there's a definite ominous feeling with diction such as the words plague and madman. Um, and as this sense of movement builds, a sense of tension is created. So let's have a look a little bit more closely. <coughs> You'll notice the underlined alliteration here, um, and then also quite a lot of. Um, bold words the words there that are bold are the ones to do with movement so we've got hurrying turning here and there whirling chasing definitely the sense of frenetic movement happening um, and the pace is picked up with the clouds come hurrying with the wind so the alliteration helps us pick up the pace there as well uh, you'll see the use of ominous diction as mentioned in the previous slide and um, what's the personification of this wind? It's the wind is tossing up things on its tail. Um, so the hint there of, of this wind perhaps being a creature of sorts, or maybe not directly personification, but plague is obviously a very negative allusion there to the plagues of Egypt. Um, sort of as God visiting his wrath on on the earth. Um, and you can interpret that as well as the destructive nature of a storm. And obviously a madman chasing nothing is a definite simile um, used there to describe the almost randomness of this wind whipping through and the storm building. Uh, because a madman firstly chasing nothing. So it's just running around um, without direction. So you'll see there the definite sense that this the poet is creating in this first stanza that there's something big coming um, and we're getting this sense of movement already. In the second stanza, there's definite focus on the clouds. Um, the clouds are described as pregnant and stately. You now something's pregnant, it means it's heavy and full of possibility, which can have a positive um, connotation. However, the image that comes next is one of sinister dark wings, almost like a gargoyle type or dark bird, which is not really as positive as the idea of pregnant. Um, the wind whistles by and the trees are bending, which shows us that the wind has got power over nature. And it's, you know, when something bends to let it pass, it's almost as if it's getting, giving it permission. Okay. <clears throat> so the clouds are gathering to perch on hills and also the word perch there with wings creates a sense of maybe this massive ominous bird of some sort. Now remember the storm is still rolling in so what the speaker is doing is creating the sense that you can see something coming. Okay. Some lovely uh, onomatopoeia there with the whistling of the wind. Um, the movement of the trees bending, um, the movement of the, the clouds are riding on the back of the wind. Um, so, so much rich imagery there for us to deal with in terms of seeing, feeling, um, sensing the storm on its way. As we said, the poem then sort of zooms in a little bit and we focus more on this idea of the village experiencing the storm. Now the children are excited. Um, perhaps they don't really understand the possible destruction of a storm. But the women who have experienced the force spurned into action, they're running around. There's a sense of tension building. 
the wind is a repeated image. And so as we get this increased tension, we know that the, um, the poet is upping the ante in terms of the, the sense that this storm is about to break. And, and so the screams of the delighted children, um, they're delighted and they're screaming, but screams is not a positive word to use. Um, and it's also a lovely auditory word. Um, screams, whistling, we've got the din of the whirling winds and some lovely alliteration, but also assonance there, tossing and turning. And here we, we can see how the different line links really come into play with creating a sense of movement in the poem as well. So we've got the women who are darting about in and out and that rare um, rhyme in the poem also creates a sort of sense of movement backwards and forwards and they're madly they're doing this madly so there's panic the babies are having to cling to the back because the women are obviously getting ready um, for the storm to hit so perhaps they're collecting things they're finding their children they're bringing in the washing um, getting things in out of the rain and out of the wind and that lovely repetition at the end of the stanza um, which reminds us that as always the wind is whistling by and the trees are bending to let it pass. Right, so just before the storm breaks, the movement gets more frenetic and we've got this um, unsettling, almost jarring image of the woman's um, clothing flying off and it exposes them. It's an uncomfortable image. This storm is more powerful than they are. The lightning is described as jagged, the onomatopoeia um, is sort of upping the volume of the storm. And now for the first time, we've not only got the, the feel of the, the storm and the sound of the storm and the visual of the storm, but now we have the smell as well. That image, that um, sensory imagery is brought in for us. <coughs> so the clothes, as we said, waving like tattered flags, and obviously tattered makes us think of... Um, an image of poverty um, and they're flimsy, they fly off. So these women don't have a way to protect themselves from the wind as they're um, running around. The jagged blinding flashes, and of course we've got that awesome onomatopoeia there, rumble, tremble, crack. We can hear the storm. Um, and we can smell the smoke of the fires being put out by the rain. Um, and so there's sort of this point now where the nature has taken over the, the rural people's environment because um, the word pelting march, even that the word march is a sort of very makes us think of something that is unstoppable and it's rhythmic and it carries on and on and on. So the storm has now hit and we get left with that as our last image of the poem, the pelting march of the storm. And we're left mostly with ominous diction. Um, now, if you've ever experienced being right in the middle of a storm, you will know what that feels like. It's very uncomfortable. Um, you feel exposed, even if you're in your house, thunder and lightning um, it's you know it's almost as if nature is taken over completely and no matter who you are what you are you're left with a sense of you're not in control um, you just have to ride out the storm as we say now if you go back to our idea of um, okay this is literally a, a description of a thunderstorm hitting an african village but remember um, that second interpretation which could be a storm of a different kind, a storm of um, colonization, a storm of Africa being taken over by something bigger than itself that they are not able to control, um, something that they frenetically try to run around to save themselves from, but the force of the colonizer is bigger than them and has the potential to wreak destru destruction and just carries on regardless of the, the measures they take to try and protect themselves. <clears throat>